My name is Dr. Rulani Edward Nguenya, and today we'll be discussing wound dressings. So we've already spoken about the process of wound healing. We've spoken about the factors that affect wound healing. Um, we've discussed the skin and its layers um, in the lecture um, that was um, looking at that. What now we are looking at is um, wound dressings. We'll be talking about the adjuncts um, of wound dressings and the process in applying this, um, which we'll be using a concept known as the time principles. Now let's quickly go into the classification of wounds. So we understand the wound, we've broken down this um, communication, there's a breakage in epithelial lining. Um, we've diagnosed it either as acute or it can be chronic as discussed in the previous wound. Um, lecture four to six weeks after, it's now a chronic wound that we are dealing with. Um, and so we, 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 we can classify wounds using the CDC wound classification, which in essence breaks down wounds into four categories. Um, four types of wound. It can be clean, it can be clean, contaminated, contaminated, and dirty. Clean wounds, a surgical incision, there's no duct or viscous communication, and usually infection there is at most 1% to 2%. So that's a clean wound. A clean surgical incision under um, you know a controlled setting. A clean contaminated wound is contamination with normal flora. So if we operate um, the oropharyngeal region, the respiratory, the alimentary, the um, GIT, gastro, you, you know, urinary system or breast even, um, that's a clean contaminated wound because of the nature of the environment where we are operating. And in general, you can double um, the infection rate, which is usually 2 to 4% infection that you can get. Then there are contaminated wounds, which are um, fresh traumatic injuries or, you know, operative procedures um, where would have gross spillage of infected content, such as me operating um, and going through the bowel or um, a patient coming in with an open fracture or a penetrating wound. That's a contaminated wound. A dirty wound, on the other hand, is, is a wound that is heavily contaminated with, you know, it's, it's clinically infected. Um, so this is a patient who's coming in, maybe acute appendicitis um, with a perforated um, appendicitis, a perforated viscous like diverticulitis. Um, abscesses are dirty wounds. Old traumatic wounds or devascularized tissue um, where there's foreign material, that's a dirty wound. And there, as opposed to contamin a contaminated wound where 5 to 15% you would get infection here with dirty wounds. You're looking at anything greater than 40% for zero. So that's a dirty wound. So when we manage wounds, um, we, 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 we consider um, the, the type of wound we are dealing with. And then we would then um, put in the protocols or the measures depending on the type of wound we are dealing with. Um, if, it's, if it's a clean wound or acutely contaminated wound, you want to make sure you debride. You want to make sure there's good vascular supply and you want to make sure that you close this wound as early as possible. Um, if not, using other adjunctive measures um, such as, you know, your... Your, your 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 wound um dressings which we'll speak about um but if it's a chronic wound this is where we speak about um wound bed preparation where we apply now our time principles and we prepare this wound bed for closure before we close it 
Remember, when you have a wound, we treat it with the, um, um, as per the reconstructive ladder that we have. And you'll remember, if we look at the reconstructive ladder, the first thing that would come in the reconstructive ladder, um, you know, was, was, was discussed um, several times. It's been modified by Iannis and his colleagues, um, Je Jeffrey Janis. And also, then we speak of the reconstructive ladder by um, Gottlieb and Kreber. But if you look at the <clears throat> the straightforward um, the the ladder, reconstructive ladder, the first thing right at the bottom here you have a wound. We allow it to heal by secondary intention. Then we move up and we close this wound primarily. Of course, we use sutures to close it. Um, and perhaps quickly after, we'll speak about sutures, just so we quickly run through and everyone has an understanding of different sutures that we use. So the next that would then follow would be um, a negative pressure wound therapy. We'll speak about it. We'll see how it assists us. Skin grafts, it's the next thing. There's a wound. You can't close it. You put a skin graft. But then now we've got a wound that, you know, the bed will not allow a skin graft to take. And so we need now flaps. But we start with local flaps. We can use dermal matrix. Um, but then if, if that doesn't work, we use um, distant flaps. And we keep climbing. There's tissue expansion we can use um, before we go up to our free um, tissue transfers that we can use. And of course, that um it's it's the way that we then climb this reconstructive ladder um of ours so remembering secondary intention closing the wound primarily perhaps let's quickly go through um you know closure of a wound we know about it we need not go into details but i'll just quickly touch on the sutures that are readily available that we use you will know of plain gut um seldom that we use it um this is an absorbable natural uh, monofilament you know a, a suture um, that only holds for about a week, tensile strength, five to seven days, um, and it's absorbed in 70 days. But the other um, options that we have is catguard, or, or rather, let's say chromic. Chromic sutures, this is also absorbable. It's a natural monofilament, and it would last for about two weeks, 10 to 14 days, which is two weeks, and absorbed um, in three months, in 90 days, it's going to be absorbed. The other absorbable sutures that we have um, will be your your vicryl. Vicryl, we've got vicryl rapid, which is your um, polycle polyclectin um, 910. Um, and we've got your normal vicryl that we have. The differences between the two, they are both absorbable synthetic braided sutures. But the difference is that with the rapid vicryl, it's rapidly absorbed in a shorter period as compared to our vicryl with the tensile strength you'd expect it in two weeks you've lost your tensile strength it lasts for about two weeks with rapid vicryl and three weeks with vicryl where is whereas um the absorption in about 42 days which is about one and a half month the rapid vicryl is absorbed however the vicryl takes about two months before it's absorbed. We look at 56 days there. Then the, the, the last two absorbable sutures we can discuss that we use quite often um, is monocryl. Monocryl is one. The difference with monocryl and vicryl, more or less the same in terms of their tensile strength. Monocryl is um, a synthetic monofilament. Um, it's, it's not braided like vicryl. Tensile strength, same as vicryl, which is three weeks, 21 days. Um, but absorption in vicryl, it's two, it's two months. In monocryl, it's three to four months. That is 91 to 119 days. Three to four months for monocryl to be absorbed. Then the last absorbable, which takes the longest to be absorbed, up to six months, is PDS. 
um, which is polydioxinone. So um, this is an absorbable um, synthetic monofilament as well. 10 cell strength, six weeks. Remember, we said three months. Uh, I mean, three weeks with mono with monocryl, um, but with PDS, it's six weeks, and this one would be absorbed in six months' time. The other sutures would use then are non-absorbable sutures, where we have nylon, which is um, you know our ethylon. Your nylon would be is a non-absorbable synthetic monofilament as well, and the tensile strength two years absorption all of these going down is indefinite all of them indefinite absorption the the absorbable sutures so the tensile strength is what's going to last you for two years your 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 polyester um is one you know we can put them in a group your polyester your your um Ethy bond that we use your 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 proline as well proline um ethy bond all of these would fall into these um non absorbable um you know synthetics however the ethy bond is braided um proline is not braided they last for many years tensile strength many years absorption indefinite. So how do we divide sutures? Absorbable, non-absorbable. There are those that are absorbed more rapidly, which is your cat guard um, and your vical rapid. Two weeks tensile strength, both of them. Um, your and then the other ones which would last you longer: your vical, your monocryl, and your PDS. Your your vical being three weeks, like your monocryl, the tensile strength, um, but your PDS being six weeks. So it's double of that. Okay. I think we've quickly done sutures and we can move away from sutures. So let's deal with the wound. Um, with the wound, what I would like us to look at um, the, 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 the ways that we manage a wound. Herein, we have a wound. Um, as we've mentioned, we can use um, you know, certain measures in order to prepare this wound. And we like um, to look at it using a simple um, mnemonic um, known as the time principle. The time principle, very easy to apply um, and, and it assists us. And this was um, published by Harris. Um, in the International Wound Journal in 2016 called Wound Bed Preparation. And in essence, it puts the time framework, T-I-M-E, um, wherein it's a, just a practical um, you know, tool um, based on identifying what the barriers um, of wound healing are and then implementing a strategy um, to, to, to remove these barriers and promote wound healing. The first T stands for tissue non-viable. So tissues that are not viable, this would be slough or, you know, necrotic tissue. If there's callus, um, an exudative wound, if there's foreign bodies, that wound you want to deprive. How do we deprive? We'll speak about it surgically. That's, of course, the first way. And we can use other adjuncts. There are different ways, enzymatic, um, chemical deprivement, biological deprivement, um, enzymatic deprivement, um, autolytic deprivement, things that we can look at. Um, and then, of course, after that, you've cleaned, you've deprived your wound, you can use other adjuncts such as your negative pressure wound therapy. We'll speak about that. I stands for inflammation or infection. So if you've got a lot of exudate, um, the wound is not smelling so well, it's malodorous, there's discoloration, that's where we are going to, over and above the department, we want to use our antimicrobials. Um, and then we also have moisture. M stands for moisture imbalance. So you've got a wound that's highly exudative. And this we want to intervene by restoring this moisture balance. 
um, absorb the exudate, um, you know, and see how we can add moisture to dry the wound. We don't want the wound completely dry. We want to, to, to treat this wound. Currently now we are in moist healing, um, but we want to strike a correct balance. If it's dry, we use certain dressings. If it's wet, we use certain dressing options and adjuncts in order to, to gain this balance. And then E will stand for edge of wound if they are not advancing. What measures can we put in to assist this? Can we, can we um, you know, address this by using which adjunct, um, perhaps a VEC dressing? Um, should we use other adjuncts in if we can try putting sutures? So these are your time principles. Tissue non-viable, inflammation infection, moisture imbalance and then edge of wound not advancing and what we can use um to to assist us in 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 getting um in getting this wound to close and to close optimally so let's let's start off with um wound dressings so now how do we classify our our wounds um so when we look at wound dressings, we classify them um, in three groups, broadly three groups. There are biological dressings, there are non-biological dressings, then there are debriding agents that are in between. And I'm going to be very simplistic in my approach. Let's start by looking at the non-biological wound dressings. So with non-biological wound dressings, they can be occlusive or they can be non-occlusive. The word is self-explanatory. Let's look at the occlusive dressings first. Occlusive dressings, let's start by this. First, you can just take a simple transparent film and just put it over that. What does it help us with? It helps us with keeping the wound moist it keeps that barrier with the external environment but it also allows us to visualize the wound bed and and we can see and be able to examine it without having to expose it so this we can put things such as your upside your turgor dam um omniderm these are coverings that can be put on top of the wound then there are tools um which just are uh, basic covers um, they usually we don't like to use them alone, but these are just basic covers which um, have pores that allow you know the exudate to escape. And these are your gelonets, your your adaptic that we use, your bactic grass, and they just a barrier a barrier on top of the wounds. And um, generally, you won't like you would not use them as the only um, dressing. You then apply something over and above that. Now, remember we spoke about the wound that you may have two types of wound. A wound which is highly exudative and with our time principles of moisture, we want to get the optimal balance and have it as a moist wound, but we don't want an exudative wound. So if it's overly exudative, we want to what? We want to absorb that exudate in order to allow the wound healing to happen optimally and the dressings not to be soaked. Otherwise, we have to change dressings over and over and over and over. Then there are wounds where we want to cover, but we want to maintain this balance of moisture. This we use hydrogels. Now, what are hydrogels? Hydrogels um, have about 95% water. And in essence, simply, simplistically, in a simple way, they donate water to the wound. So they keep giving water bits and bits and bits into the wound, keeping this wound moist. These are excellent dressings. Intracide is one of them that we use as a hydrogel just to donate water and keep the wound moist. Then there's this wound that is highly exudative and we want to make sure that we absorb as much as we can, but we don't leave it dry. We absorb, but we keep some level of moisture. And so here we can use either hydrocolloids, we can use hydropolymers, or we can use hydrofibrins. What is this? Let's start with hydrocolloids. 
Hydrocolloids, in essence, are hypotonic, um, hydrophobic um, dressings that absorb fluids. So you put it there, it just takes, it, it, it absorbs the fluids there, um, keeping this wound dry but in a moist balance. And these are like your comfield dressings that we put um, in patients with maybe sacral bed ulcers, you know. Granuflex is another dressing that you can use. Hydropolymers are highly absorptive. So you've got a wound that is, um, you know, e e highly exudative. And so you put this elevin, elevin, a good dressing we can put even in pressure ulcers, sacral um, ulcers, elevin, beautiful. We put it there. Or biotin um, is another that we use. And they have a highly absorptive, um, you know, capacity. And then they are your hydrofibrins. Um, which also help in absorption um, and but maintaining the moist and these are things like your aquacell. There are others that may have silver like your aquacell AG and there are other um, different brands that are coming in the market. And so we then have a VEC dressing which I'm not going to speak about here um, but a VEC dressing may serve um, for this purpose. Um, but I will put it as a star as it's a kind of a special child, let's call it. Now, the non-biological, we said they're occlusive, but they are non-occlusive dressings as well. What are some of the non-occlusive dressings? Um, dry dressings that just indicates oxid, you know, your, your exudate like a gauze. You can just simply put a gauze or draw text, um, serves as, as, as that. Um, and just absorbing dry dressings. Um, like your Actisorb, which, you know, um, <clears throat> all they do, um, especially in wounds with an odor, um, a foul odor, and Actisorb, quite good in this. And then, of course, there are those with silver dressings um, that we can use your silver, such as your Acticoat, that fall into these non-occlusive dressings. There are debriding agents. There's a number of them. Debriding, we will divide them into chemical and enzymatic chemical and enzymatic um and 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 in essence um i'll just give two examples chemical debridement i'm going to put something that you know we we sometimes put as non um as an occlusive um non-biological dressing but with the specialized cap capacity as it is um you know many we've moved it into the group of chemical debridement your melodem melodem plus it's a specialized honey that can work and assist here in debriding especially for wounded slough um certainly melodem plus um has those extra abilities to assist more than the honey. It's just a specialized honey. Um, and of course, we have enzymatic um, using your, you know, collagenase, protease. Um, and an example here is iroxol. Then there are biological dressings. And biological is simple. You can just say cellular or acellular or cell-free matrix. The cellular ones um such as your your dermagraft your transite um can be used and of course the expense goes higher um and then we've got your cell free matrix um and i'm speaking about things which are commonly present which we have them in our setting um and so you would notice i'm not mentioning names of things we don't have um, so your cell-free matrix, we've got things like BioBrain, good in superficial um, burns, you know, your, your 2A burns coming in. You can put your BioBrain um, in that, in that a, a partial thickness burn there, um, superficial. And Integra, um, which is a dermal matrix that we use also, um, and Eloderm, which are other options. So these are your cell-free matrix um versus your cellular the biological dressings that we have so i think we've spoken about wound healings um about the dressings the options that you have um and perhaps just a last thing we can quickly touch on the adjuncts without getting too much into detail um therein so the adjuncts that we have um of of wound healing 
um, we can we can quickly just focus on a few. There are many adjuncts, um, and majority there are some that we seldom use. Um, but when we speak of adjuncts, we 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 in essence speak of anything extra, call it that we will use to assist us in this wound healing process. Um, and and so we've spoken about cleaning and irrigating um, that you would use as an adjunct. There are debridements where we've spoken of surgical debridements that you would use, non-selective debridements. Selective debridements is surgical, um, enzymatic debridement that we've spoken of that takes advantage of naturally occurring enzymes um, that will just selectively um, digest your devitalized tissue and autolytic debridement that allows your, 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 the body's own enzymes um, and moisture to break down this necrotic tissue, um, such as, you know, the things we've spoken about, your transparent films, hydrocolloids, hydrogels, calcium, um, alginates, um, all of these enhance autolytic debridement and then your biological debridement. There's negative pressure wound therapy, um, which perhaps let's quickly go into. It works in three, in three ways. Um, one, it decreases the bacterial load because we know if we've got a bacteria of 10 to the power of 5, the wound is not going to heal. So it decreases your bacterial load. Two, um, it assists by limiting the edema. So by sucking the fluid, it's got a fluid um, function. Sucking in that fluid, um, we decrease edema and so we decrease the we the space between which cells can communicate um and perfusion can then occur and nutrition of cells um and then lastly there's the mechanical function they're in where um we can divide it into the macro uh, mechanical and the micro mechanical macro mechanical being um the um, the, the the ability to pull this wound and pull the edges together so that we can get this closure um that your your macro stain is strain um and then there's the micro strain which are you know tiny pieces of tissue which are drawn into a a, a foam contact dressing and this it causes then these uh, micro deformations um, and, and, and induce a mechanical stress that stimulates angiogenesis and tissue growth. So that's in, you know, succinctly how negative pressure wound therapy would then work. Um, and the applications, as, as you've seen, are vast in this. Um, other adjuncts you may use is HPO, which is hyperbaric oxygen. Um, I'm not going to go into it. We we do ad we address it extensively when we speak about um, radiation. Um, there you will find HPO and and you know um, the the way it works, it functions, how you give this hundred percent oxygen um, above atmospheric pressure at a determined time frame, and how we use certain protocols like Marx protocols um, to assist us in 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 getting a good result. Um, but the way that it works, it's important for 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 one to look at. Um, another adjunct that is used, lasers. There is a talk on lasers, laser, low energy lasers, something that is, is stated or um, not used as often in our setting, but lasers you can put and all it is is just light amplification um, using, you know, stimulated emission um, of radiation, um, rad radiation to, 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 to um, sort of um, enhance wound healing. And they would, uh, you know, there are many postulations that it accelerates healing of ischemic, hypoxic, and infected wounds. Um, specifically, not on its own when it's used um, with your your hyperbaric oxygen. Um, and 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 all it does is to tell you it excites physiological processes um, that results in increased cellular activity in the wounded skin and it promotes epithelialization but um there is a talk on lasers um and electrostimulation you can look at that and get more information um the 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 other thing maybe we can look at quickly is um platelet rich plasma 
aptly um, they described it well in the PRS um, in 20, 2006. Um, when when it is coming basically what it is we know that platelets um are, are um cytoplasmic frag fragments of um your mega kerocytes um which is a type of white blood cells that's formed in the marrow um they lack nuclei but they contain a lot of things mitochondria microtubules granules your alpha delta lambda um granules um and they're concentrated mainly in the spleen but they are involved extensively in wound healing we know they last for about 10 days before they are removed by macrophages of the reticular endothelial system um but <clears throat> They, their function is, is, is well recognized in terms of hemostasis um, by, you know, forming this platelet plug um, and, and, and when they get activated, which is a process known as degranulation, um, they, 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 you know, um, secrete certain proteins such as your platelet derived growth factors, tissue growth factor B. Um, which which you know are transformed to a bioactive state um by you know adding histosomes con you know um carbohydrate side chains and 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 you get clotting you know um and immediately within 10 minutes you you have these released and they are you know um chemotactic um they have that ability and assist in the next phases so when these are secreted we know that the posting protein uh, or rather platelet derived growth factors and you know tissue growth factor b um tumor growth factor b they are the ones that then um stimulate um the macrophages and start the process of proliferation so in essence if we can increase the level of platelets um which is just basically platelet rich plasma is just um a portion of plasma that has you know a a a what can i say a platelet concentration that is above them the baseline so we we take this um we centrifuge this um and when you centrifuge this just before theater um you'll get three layers you know the top layer will be um your your plasma layer your bottom layer will be red blood cells because they have a, a higher specific um gravity of 1.09 but the middle layer is what we are after because this consists of platelets and white blood cells, and this is that puffy coat um, area. And so we will then use that, um, but just knowing that, you know, after preparation, um, it's, it's, it's only stable for about eight hours um, in an anticoagulated state. So, but before they are used or before they can work, they must be activated um, in order, you know, to release the the um their alpha granule content and which we spoke about. So platelet derived um you know platelet rich um plasma assists in wound healing. Certainly not on its own. It's an adjunct that you can use to improve the wound healing. And of course, if you've listened to the, our wound healing talk you would see that the platelets um, are, you know, by far in the initial factors that go in and that assist not just in the inflammatory um, or the hemostatic inflammatory phase, but also the proliferative phase through the, the growth factors that we have. Um, there are other pharmacological measures that you can use, you know, your topical agents, your antibiotics. Um, we can replace nutrients. We've spoken about the effect of vitamins, you know, your minerals, ions, um, and growth factors, you know, that you can give. There are agents. Um, we don't use them in our setting, but um, we found that, you know, your platelet-derived growth factor is 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 is... Um, quite effective um, in, in, you know, assisting this wound healing. And so there are also pharmacological agents like your procurin, they call it, um, or your, reg I think Reganex is one of the other drugs 
um, that or the agents, which are in essence platelet derived growth factors. So it's just knowing about wound healing and what's involved in wound healing and using those adjuncts to then help us. I hope we found the talk to be helpful. Um, I know we rushed through a lot, just trying to squish everything into about 30 to 40 minutes so that we don't have an extensive thing, um, you know, lecture. But all it is, in a sense, is just to, to, to remind us I and mean, give us in a quick session um, the, 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 the factors or, or the, 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 the armory that we can use in assisting us um, with things such as wound healing. Thank you for your attention. Enjoy the rest of your day. Ta-ta.